Hello, Mirror fans. I am here today on location in Venice VR at the Venice Bridge in a very nice, quiet place to interview Xinqian Huang. Um, so happy you could find the time to meet with me today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, very happy to have an interview. So I'm fascinated by the body of work that you have been working on lately, and I'm just uh, privileged enough to be able to get into a time slot to see your bodiless mm -hmm. work that you created. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it, and also about your inspiration for making the work? Uh, okay. The, uh, sure. Bodyless is a surreal VR experience. It's very dreamlike, and the uh, the initial uh, momentum to create this piece is actually is coming from my mother, uh, because uh, the uh, the experience portraying my uh, childhood, uh, which is like in the 1960 and the 1970. At that period of time, uh, Taiwan is under the martial law, and uh, the government is pretty much a totalitarian uh, ruling class. Um, so, at that time, a lot of bad things happened, and I remember my in my childhood, my mother often told us about our family history, and uh, but recently, my mother have. Uh, Alzheimer disease and uh, her mind start to uh, fading away. So I started thinking if I can uh, make the story she told me into a VR experience, and then when it complete, I can show it to her. Uh, I think that would be a wonderful thing. So that's uh, well, how this project started. And uh, the experience is about like uh, an old man who is a political criminal. Uh, he's in prison in this cell. And then uh, there's some kind of like a, a supernatural forces uh, which deteriorating his, uh, his shape into those uh, like a simple geometry low polygon uh, figures and then as the story go by and then he died the audience uh, uh, will see the story from his point of view so when he died he become a ghost and then uh, descended into uh, this underworld and according to Taiwanese tra traditional uh, folk belief that Every seven uh, months of the lunar calendar, the uh, the ghost will have a chance to come out from the underworld and then go to uh, to revisit their families. So um, so then he will uh, ascend from the underworld and then go through or experience this uh, Chinese traditional folk festival like a uh, uh, burning. A paper ship and uh, uh, parade and also the uh, water lantern and then finally he uh, found his uh, family uh, house and then but when he enters the whole house is empty and uh, and then he found out that uh, those uh, mysterious figure and the uh, sound that uh, started or uh, appeared from the very beginning, uh, turned everything into the digital form. So uh, this, this is not only about the past, but also a reflection of our current uh, digital technology, which is like, uh, uh, we think the modern technology should make us uh, understand more about our neighbors and the friends but instead I think the uh, digital tool for example like the uh, big data artificial intelligence and the uh, surveillance actually uh, simplify our understanding for example like uh, President Trump using the tweet 
which is 144 word or characters to describe the uh, state of the nations, which is such an oversimplified uh, description. And <clears throat> so, so when I think like the old days, uh, totalitarian actually is merging with the modern uh, digital technology and the forming this uh, really sad uh, si situation right now. So let's count the uh, uh, what I want to say in this VR experience. Well, having just come out of it, it was really a very moving and beautifully created work. And I also had the pleasure to talk to you a bit about what your idea for the installation would be. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that because, you know, I'm so interested in the fusion of the physical space and the importance of what you can do from the moment the person walks into the space to the moment that the person leaves the space. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, something that we uh, currently also uh, started to develop. For example, like in, uh, this year, June, we just have an installation in the Manchester International Festival with Lori. Uh, what we did is that we bring our uh, VR experience to the moon, uh, bring it to a, a small theater space. So what we did is that we also uh, do an immersive theater, which is like uh, we projected uh, uh, all the wall and the floor. And uh, also one of the wall is, uh, is a hologra holographic projection, uh, which is like a black screen. So behind the black screen, that's uh, actually it's a VR station, uh, eight of them. So because what we think that uh, in this uh, immersive theater, uh, which will be a very good preparation for the audience to enter the VR world. So they were waiting in the, this uh, immersive theater for a couple of minutes and then uh, seeing the uh, surrounding projections, uh, which is like a moonscape. Then they will uh, go behind the screen and then wear the VR helmet and then actually go into the uh, VR world. And also, um, so do you, when you are exhibiting uh, to the moon, um, are you going to change, are you going to have the same type of installation in each venue or will you change the installation depending on where you're showing it? Well, we have uh, a rough uh, material that we'll be uh, using for most of the installation, but uh, we also try to find new ways to uh, make the VR installation because I think uh, what is interesting is that uh, to merge the physical space and with the virtual space. Uh, so that's the reason why the, uh, for example, the to the moon or chuck room, the VR experience we did, it, we will uh, build an identical model, a virtual model of the physical space. So when the visitor, when they uh, wear the VR helmet, they will see an identical uh, virtual space, just like a real one. And then the, the virtual space dissolve or collapse and then show them the, uh, the virtual space. So we think that's an important transition and also uh, for the audience to transit from the real to the virtual world. Yes, I, I can't stress the importance of uh, considering the full user experience when you make a physical installation like this. And also, I was fortunate enough to see the presentation of the Chalk Room, mm -hmm. uh, co-directed by you and Lori Anderson, in the Fize Center right. a couple of years ago, which was really a wonderful installation. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, when you were uh, touring the Chalk Room to different venues, yeah. was it the same installation in different places? or? Uh, uh, was it a different one? Tell me, but we have uh, site set specific. Of, so yeah. there were site specific uh, installations. Yeah, and we have uh, a set of wallpaper. So we will um, output the wallpaper to fit to the uh, environment. And uh, if Lori had more time, uh, because she do all the chalk drawing, so we did the uh, in the mass mocha uh, in 
Massachusetts and also in, for example, in the uh, Counts, uh, Lori actually uh, hand painted all the chalk drawings. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. That's so interesting. And uh, speaking of artistic pursuits, we had a, a little conversation about your background that I think would be great for mirror viewers to hear about also. Um, going back, mm-hmm. you were talking about yeah. your education. Yeah. What you're doing so, now is also very interesting. So I have a background in mechanical engineer, and then when I go to the United States, I start to start, uh, study uh, product design, and then I got the uh, product, master degree in product design in the Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, but after I graduated, I didn't do any design work, or I uh, go, started to go to the uh, video game industry, uh, working for Sega and Sony on the Dreamcast and PlayStation 2. So I think uh, to, to work on VR, I think uh, all those backgrounds actually provide me a very good uh, basis. Uh, because I think the VR definitely is a cross-discipline uh, art form. Uh, and uh, I think if I only know how to do or build video again, I think it's very hard to do VR because I think you need to have a lot of understanding of the, the physical world. For example, like uh, art- architects or like interior design. I think my design background give me that uh, the understanding of the physical space. Um, and then you will need to have like a coding and uh, 3D graphic uh, capability, which I learned from the uh, video game industry. And uh, also like uh, sometimes we need to build ourselves some uh, small devices for the VR. Uh, which is coming from my engineering background. But I remember also you told me that your family are oh, yeah. all have various uh, backgrounds in art. Yeah, my mother is uh, oil painting and also a traditional uh, Chinese painter. Uh, oh, okay. So, so I think, for example, my sister, uh, she's now a, a potter, and uh, my brother, he's. He's, uh, he's retired, but he, now he's a documentary filmmaker. Okay. So that's all influenced by my mother. That's quite something. And did your mother ever get to see the piece when you finished uh, the body? Yeah, lesson? we just Kinda finished gentry. it and then sent it to here. So after I go back to Taiwan, I will show and it to her. She will get to see it. Wonderful. Um, I'm wondering also if you have something to say about how you ended up in VR. Mm-hmm. Your decision to... Yeah. Um, I start to have interest in VR uh, in like many years ago. I remember I brought my first uh, headset in uh, I think it's ninety six or ninety seven. Oh, really? Yeah. A long time. <laughs> yeah, but at that time there's no uh, developing software, and uh, I just got it uh, without any tracking uh, features. So, so I think, uh, but I, I think one thing that really uh, made me interested, uh, probably is because uh, I, I in my childhood I have a cornea transplant, so my right eye uh, has a very poor eyesight. So I always feel that uh, I'm, uh, I'm attracted to anything that's moving. So the moving image is just like a drop to me. I can watch any moving screen for for, for hours. <laughs> so so when the VR come out, I think oh this is uh, really something that I I want to try. And uh, also I think the VR is the, is a tool that allow the artists, especially poor artists, could be as ambitious as his imagination goes. So for example, if you want to build a city, for example, like a chakra, we build something that's as big as a city. And uh, it just 
cost me the electricity and also uh, my working hours. Uh, so I think the VR actually is uh, is something that for especially for the poor, he can just go as crazy as he want. Mm, that's really interesting. And the, what about your transition from? I think you mentioned to me you were working in the game industry. Yes. And then you made a switch into VR. Yeah, um, I worked on the video game industry for I think six or seven years uh, as art director. And uh, in 1999, uh, at that time, the video game industry is uh, really uh, hard working. Like we had to work 12 to 14 hours a day. Mm. And uh, also at that time, uh, one day I saw the uh, the news about the Columbine shooting. At that time, we had also developed a, a, a shooting game. So I started to think, what I'm doing, is that really beneficial to the society uh, or not? Uh, I think a lot of people are still debating like the, the video game uh, is not a cause of those uh, mass shooting. But, uh, just give an example from my uh, from my experience is that uh, for for gamer every day or when I work on the video game industry, uh, I will spend at least uh, four hours a day playing video games. So all those behavior uh, after I play and play it, I sort of feel that. Uh, I will take those behavior in the video game to the real world. So uh, take the Columbine shooting as an example. The gun they are using uh, in the shooting is identical uh, of the gun they are using in the video game. Really? Yes. Oh my gosh. So you can find out like, wow. the many uh, cases of those young men uh, shooting they are using the same weapons. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I think that's a proof that they are... If you imagine like you're playing, uh, you're, you're experiencing something every day, four hours, and uh, for 365 e days a year, can you believe that you won't take those behavior out of that experience? I think that's hard to believe. Yeah, I agree. I used to be a clinical psychologist, so I, I really do believe that there is some correlation and that some people are more easily affected by, yeah. by what they see right. than others as well. So after that, I started thinking, uh, and also, <laughs> I just said, that I, because all those uh, long hours and I'm playing video games, I think that's really have a bad influence on me. For example, like in the video game, uh, I will, uh, for example, I'll play those first person shooters. And uh, after I get uh, get back to home and I drive at the street, I will feel, although I'm driving at San Francisco uh, street, I'm driving like uh, 40 miles per hour, but I feel I'm driving so slow. So like in the two or three o'clock in the morning, I would drive like like 50 miles on the the city yeah. street, uh -huh. and I feel I'm very lucky I didn't uh, get into any car accident. <laughs> but I just start to feel that uh, I'm losing the uh, self preservations, mm -hmm. and uh, so I decide I need to quit this job, and uh, I I go back to Taiwan and use the uh, skills that I learned from the video game and start to uh, put on the new media art. And can you tell me a little bit about the history of your new media art making? Okay, uh, well, I start to um, doing new media art in the beginning. It's kind of like a projection uh, with uh, video interactive kind of thing. Uh, and then... And this was what year? It's uh, 2001. Okay. Yeah. And also, I did a lot of uh, fine art print using the 3D, uh, 3D software to do uh, like a really large uh, rendering, like uh, two or three meters big. Mm. Then I started to transit to, uh, 
to like for example mechanical devices. Uh, I did the uh, public art in uh, Taiwan's uh, MRT station, which is using those uh, uh, slip flat board uh, to. Uh, so I'm building a, a, the whole installation is about 200 uh, those uh, flat board devices uh, uh, with the uh, Taiwanese uh, people's faces. Uh, and also I also work on the uh, several uh, pop singers concert to do the, develop the visuals uh, on the, uh, the LED screen and also the sound uh, devices. And if people would like to see more images from your work, what is, is there a website that they can go to? Uh, uh, if you uh, search for Story Nest, uh, S-T-O-R-Y-N-E-S-T, then you can go to my website. Uh, okay, great, because I'm sure our viewers would like to see yeah. more of your work. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today. It's been very exciting and I just have a final question for you. What's next? Well, um, Lori and I, we are thinking about our next VR project. Um, I think it's pretty ambitious. Uh, she's thinking about uh, a VR opera. <laughs> wow, so okay. We're still not sure what it is, but we will probably take a year to develop it. Okay, well, I'm sure that everybody joins me in wishing you guys the best of luck in your new creation and that we can't wait to see what's upcoming. And also, did you mention to me you'll be in New York yeah. gaining inspiration yeah. uh, for the next year on a Fulbright? Yeah, so I'm the Fulbright Scholar uh, right now and uh, I'm with the uh, Pratt Institute. Uh, so for the next year, I will be in Pratt. And will you be teaching courses as well, uh, or doing workshops? More like a research, and also um, just uh, interact with the students. Yeah. Okay, a lucky students. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you again so much for thank talking you. with me, yeah. and look forward to talking to you another time. Yes.